Hello. Uh, so I'm on a little bit early, because I am the guy that runs the Linux laptop. Which means one of two things. This talk is going to end early because my battery died. Or it's just going to blow up. Who knows? So I want to talk to you about performance and specifically speed. Now, before we start, I just want everyone to raise their hands, please. Now would be a good time. Thank you. If you have used WebAssembly before, keep your hands up. Everyone else, hands down. <laughs> It's always the same, honestly. Uh, if you've used WebAssembly on a server, keep your hand up. What, one? One. What? Right. Hopefully that's going to change after today, right? I'm going to show you some pretty interesting stuff focusing on speed and performance and along with a few other really cool details that come with a WebAssembly implementation for your cloud-native applications and microservices. Now, when we talk about performance and speed, I could come up here and do some hand-waving and go, Graph, chart, but this all means nothing, really, right? It's boring. <laughs> we need to do this another way. And what I've found is that if we can make performance characteristics relatable to our everyday life by using known brands, frameworks, products, whatever, then the, um, the, it's going to resonate better with your head and you're going to remember it, hopefully. Now, before we start talking about performance, I want to talk about nanoseconds. Does anyone know how much or how many nanoseconds there are in a second? Feel free to shout out. It's all right, no worries. We're going to dive into it. Um, so we're going to try and make performance with WebAssembly rela relatable by mapping nanoseconds. Now, you're not going to work. Oh, maybe it will. Oh, you're not going to get the sound, right? It doesn't matter. We'll improvise. So what I wanted to do there, everyone knows the song Master Puppets, I hope. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Come on. I'm assuming we're all geeks in Europe. We're all metalheads, and we like the Matrix. So some of that's going to be true. I was going to play you one second of Master Puppets, and if you're not familiar, that pretty much sounds like... Dun! But I really, really wanted to play you 30 seconds, a minute, fuck the whole song if I could, but I only have 20 minutes. Um, but honestly, when I started to compare the nanoseconds and make them relatable with microseconds and milliseconds, the numbers got so huge that it just lost all sense of well, sensibility. It didn't make sense at all anymore. So what we're doing right now is mapping one nanosecond to one second of Master of Puppets. Everyone with me? <laughs> so when we talk about WebAssembly invocations, we're talking about an invocation of a binary in a WebAssembly sandbox in 1 to 1.5 nanoseconds. We're mapping that to one second. And for anyone who's not familiar, a microsecond is a million nanoseconds, and a millisecond is a billion nanoseconds. Container startup times, and I'm being sometimes generous here, but 100 to 200 milliseconds is considered average. Now, of course, when we use things like Lambda and other serverless frameworks, they try to keep that container hot by setting, or sending multiple requests to the container so that you don't have to take this 200 millisecond startup time every single time. But then we lose a lot of the isolation that we want from our serverless architecture. So what does this mean now that we've covered what milliseconds, microseconds, and nanoseconds are? Well, going back to our comparison of one nanosecond as one second, you could listen to the entire Master of Puppets 2,000 times. This is one microsecond now. Carrying on with that, you could watch The Matrix 122 times. So remember, one to two nanoseconds invocation of a WebAssembly module, when we're measured in a microseconds, we're not even at milliseconds yet, you could watch the matrix. This is how different these numbers are from a performance and execution perspective. And if we bump this microsecond up to a millisecond, you can watch the matrix 185,000 times. This is one millisecond, not 200 milliseconds for our container startup. 
So hopefully you realize just how important invocation time is for working with serverless architectures. This actually enables, this nanosecond speed, enables us to do truly scale down to zero, no caching or hot containers to handle requests, given us the promise of something called unikernels from about 10 years ago, which would be that every web request could come through a truly sandboxed and isolated runtime. WebAssembly gives us that possibility. Now, if we do bump this up to the 100 milliseconds, I'm still not even getting to 200, we're not gonna bother because again, the numbers are getting ridiculous now. But 3,000 light years away, there is a star, which brilliantly, uh, this summer, will be having a nova explosion, which will be visible by the eye. If you're not familiar with this and you like astronomy, you should definitely check this out. So, big, <laughs> big difference between nanoseconds, microseconds, and milliseconds, especially with our startup. Now, obviously, this is not a picture of me. Um, I'm a husband and a father and a furry father. We have a lot of pets in my house. I have chinchillas, I have dagoos, a ferret, a cat, I have dogs, um, and this is a chinchilla. And I just use this picture instead of a photo of me now because the number one question I get every time I give a talk is, what's a chinchilla? So, now you know. I'm the founder of the Rock Code Academy. I'm from Scotland, and I focus on helping people with cloud-native technologies, microservices, containers, Kubernetes, and everything in between. Uh, and if you're interested in my explanation of WebAssembly and other cool stuff, you can find me on Twitter at Rock Code. So, a few of you did have your hands up when I asked if you were familiar with WebAssembly. And you might be going, well, hold on a minute. WebAssembly does have a sandbox, and I don't see how you can run any true back-end service with WebAssembly. And you'd be right, WebAssembly runs in a browser, it's secure sandbox. It doesn't actually have access to a lot of things like disk I.O., um, file systems, sockets. You know, you can't go running a server inside of your browser. Well, not through WebAssembly. But it is truly portable to the point where if I ship a .wasm binary and give it to anyone, they can run it with any WebAssembly runtime. Um, and that's not something we get with containers. I'm hoping some of you are using containers in your day-to-day -day now. Some of you are probably on new shiny Macs, which have ARM processors, and some of you might be on Linux like me with standard x86, but those container images aren't portable at all, even though we were delivered the promise about a container image and run it everywhere. Um, WebAssembly does solve this challenge, and as we've already covered, it is exceptionally fast. So how do we expand WebAssembly to be able to support serverless backend style workloads? And this comes down to a WebAssembly working group, an official working group, um, and they've deployed or created uh, the WASI specification, which just means that it is the WebAssembly systems interface. This is essentially a POSIX-like implementation for WebAssembly on the server. Now, they don't actually ship any implementations of this stuff. They define interfaces for things like sockets, I.O., file systems, uh, and everything else that you might need for an actual backend application. And it's then down to the WebAssembly runtimes to provide those interfaces or via WASI components. So this opens up a whole new pattern of things that we can do. Now, let's come back to speed for just a little bit. Speed isn't just about how fast do I get to the place, right? You know, we want to go fast, but we also want to go far. So if I was just standing up here and telling you that WebAssembly is fast, but it stabs you in the heart every 14 seconds, it's probably not something you'd want to try and adopt, right? And I don't know why I used that analogy of stabbing you in the heart. That just came out of nowhere. But we want to go fast, we want to go far, and in order to go far, we need to make some compromises. Now this car on the left may be super fast, but am I going to want to do a 700 mile drive in it? No. On the right, we have a Kia EV6. It's got suspension, it's got aircon, it's got all the comforts. It may go fast enough for our use case, and we can go as far as we need, provided you've got a good charging network, of course. And when we talk about going far with projects, you know, given that I'm a content creator with a YouTube channel and over 400 hours of content, I explore and play with new software literally every single day. And I always find that the key to adoption is for teams and software products that get the developer experience right. Now, it's probably not a wise move for me to stand here and quote myself on a stage, but I generally love this quote. 
And I just want people to really think about developer experience and put it first, right? And the thing I always focus on is, will someone be successful with intuition rather than informed decisions? And if you get that right, people will enjoy working with your library and framework. With this being said, if you're going to walk away today and think, OK, let's try this WebAssembly for back-end services, the project that I want you to walk away and explore is one called Spin from a company called Fermion. Now, it provides a framework that allows you to build HTTP-based serverless functions. You can use any language that you want. However, they do have some um, languages that are supported better than others by providing SDKs that allow you to hook into their abstractions and their components. Now, you can ship to Fermion Cloud. They have a free tier, but I'm not here to talk about that. You can also ship this thing to Kubernetes. We're now in a situation where we have hybrid architectures with containers and WebAssembly side by side built on top of the world's most prominent orchestration tool, Kubernetes. And what I want to show you today is that they get the developer experience right by giving you a batteries included approach to building these services. Now, again, I'm on Linux, so who knows what's going to happen? And to make things worse, I'm not just on Linux, I'm on Nix OS, which means I can't run anything that's statically compiled. I've had to go through a few hoops and run this all in a container. Um, I mean, it's 50-50 at this point in time. So we're going to jump into my next shell. Oh, don't you dare refresh. Oh, unfortunately, the connection's OK. I did this in a hotel room two hours ago, and it downloaded 5 gig. So you know, the fact that it's managed to pull 26 meg just now, I'm OK with that. If it tried to pull the 5 gig, I'd probably just be storming off stage. Come on, you can get there. Come on. <laughs> right. So, because I'm on Nexus, I have mounted the exact same directory that I have here. I'm going to show you some code, but what I want to do is just show you the onboarding experience, the getting started experience of building a spin application. From here, we can run spin new, and I've already got a whole bunch of templates that allow me to get started. Now, we're going to do an HTTP-based services, but as we'll cover, there are other ways to integrate spin with your existing infrastructure, such as triggers, cron, etc. But right now, we're just going to say we want an HTTP TypeScript service, and we'll call this .js. Now, the description isn't important, so I just skipped over that. We then have an HTTP path, which right now we're going to wildcard it with three dots. This just means that this component will handle all traffic into this application. Well, this isn't going to end well. I did do this in advance, too, so I'm glad that that worked. All right, so now we can run a spin build. Oh, go into my .js. Oh, maybe that's why it worked. <laughs> Dreads. Let's take a look at the code while that runs in the background. So what we get is a spin.toml, where we can see that we have an HTTP trigger. And again, we're using a wildcard. And this routes all traffic to our .js component. This is just configured. You don't need to worry about tweaking this or changing this in any way. But if you want to use other build tooling uh, that's not NPM, you want to use BUN, you want to use PNPM, whatever that is, you can just modify the build script to be whatever you need. Now, I've done some weird stuff with this um, to the point where you can actually build an entire Remix or Astro site and ship it as a WebAssembly module via an OCI registry and ship it to production. Anyone who wants to see an example of that, I will be around later on today as well. Then we pop open our index.ts, and all we have is a very simple handle request function, which is a type signature, where we just return a status code, our headers, and any sort of body that we want. This will now be available on port 3000, assuming, yep, we can do a spin build and a spin up. Now, obviously, that's a whole load of nothing. However, one of the things that really stands out from the DX here is that I can then implement my own router here to handle multiple routes or run spin add, where I can say I want to add a JavaScript service. I'll give it a name and call it uh, hello and have it respond on hello. We can then run our spelled build, spin build.
and spin up. Now, if we modify this path to hello, we get hello from the JS SDK. Now, this implementation isn't that important, but what I love about this is that we now have this very modular fashion of bringing in polyglot cloud-native applications. I can use some Rust where I need it to. I can use some Zig. I can use JavaScript. I can use TypeScript. I can use whatever language I want, building these up as single function services that get deployed together as a single binary, but comes with open telemetry, centralized logging, and a whole bunch of other really cool things. So batteries included. Composition is really important. As we add more of these components in our different languages, we may need to be able to facilitate um, calling them from one another. So we have something called component-based routing. Now, because this is a truly sandboxed WebAssembly environment, we actually have to allow each component individually access to different hosts. So we have this allow outbound hosts where we can set it to spin.internal or a wildcard. Spin.internal is configured for you that does routing across the components within your application. You then just use your standard fetch API, job done. Now, you can have interfaces and types for all of these requests and handle serialization between them. You just work your native tool chain, and I think that is the true power of what WebAssembly is enabling for us with these new architectures. If you do routing yourself, you can just allow HTTP self, which will route to the same component, and then you can add whatever path within that component that you need to do. We also have triggers. So if we want to do HTTP, like you've seen, it just listens on a path and on a port, it's fine. But we also have the ability to subscribe to Redis or MQTT. We just configure this as part of the spin.toml. It handles all the plumbing. You don't need to worry about it. This is the joy of WebAssembly components. Spin as a runtime and SDK allows you to hook into all of these tools without ever understanding how they work behind the scene. And then there's cron. If you just need to run something on a schedule, that is available as well. But of course, we need state. If we're going to run an application that we want to make money, it cannot be stateless as much as we try. So we need the ability to use key value storage or maybe even SQLite databases. And these are both provided for us as well. So from a KV point of view, this could use Redis or any other implementation. The APIs are defined in a way that the backing thing can be changed. You can move from Redis to Postgres, whatever, from a runtime or operational perspective, but your code doesn't need to change. SQLite databases are all provided by um, Tarzo on Fermion Cloud, which is a fantastic project. Um, and locally, because it's just SQLite, it just creates a file where all your data will be stored. Now, you get a SQLite connection back, so this should work with some um, ORMs such as Drizzle, where they work with zero dependencies in an edge runtime environment. So there's some experimentation still to be done here, but you do get raw access to the SQL. And this support is growing all the time. It's an open source project spin. So you know these things are quite easy to build yourself or just open issues and the team will hopefully get to it. Now, of course, you can't have a talk these days without saying LLM or AI at some point, and I'm sorry to drop it on you. But Spin have covered this well. We can just add the models to our TOML, update our import to pull in the LLM, and then with a single line of code, we can fire a prompt and it's all handles for you. Now, if you're using Fermion Cloud, all the GPU processing is handled for you remotely, even when running locally, if you configure it that way, or you can use your own local GPU, but you do have to download those models yourself. But I don't think I've ever seen an easier um, API and interface to working with these models than Spin have provided. Lastly, Spin is super extensible. Everything I've shown you is a WebAssembly component or part of the runtime. You can actually build most of what you've seen in under about 200 lines of some Rust code, which I know might be scary, but Rust is a fantastic language to learn. It teaches you about things that you kind of take for granted on these higher level languages. So you can build components, integrations, templates, and even WASI components. So in summary, fast, portable, polyglot, fantastic developer experience, and incredibly scalable. Remember the numbers, right? We're measuring in nanoseconds. You can scale to zero and handle every request in a unique sandbox. Is it too early? Um, I'm not going to click on this because I've got minus four seconds left. But you can search for PHP WASM on Google, click on it, and you will see Drupal 
rendered in a WebAssembly module, rendered in your server, in your browser. There is no server component, and Drupal works. If you can do that, I'm going to say you can start building some pretty cool shit with WebAssembly. So thank you so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed this session.